Thank you. So ladies and gentlemen, <coughs> it is uh, a special day uh, to be here at uh, Columbia. I thought it was fantastic to listen to the Prime Minister of New Zealand. She's uh, such an inspiration to uh, people in New Zealand, to young girls and women, uh, young leaders, but to, to all of us really uh, and beyond New Zealand as well. Uh, so it's, it's um, uh, fantastic to share the stage with her. Um, and it's nice to be here at this uh, World Leader Forum, uh, the Kapinski Development Lecture, the International Conference on Sustainable Development, and to talk to all of you uh, and everyone who's uh, following uh, online. I actually wanted to go to Colombia and study at one point. I wanted to study development. Uh, so Colombia was definitely a, uh, on my list there, and I wanted to go to Earth Institute and uh, uh, study with uh, Professor Jeffrey Sachs. Uh, I, I actually uh, decided in the end to uh, stay a bit closer to home, so I did my, uh, my master's in, in Europe. Uh, but it's quite special for me to be here at uh, Columbia. So today I'm going to talk about development, human progress, uh, and why I believe in a brighter future. So I'm optimistic and hopeful. That's going to be my main theme. But um, if we look at the news today, we see that we have a world uh, where um, we hear about population growth. We hear about um, poverty and inequality. Uh, we hear about uh, war and conflict. Um, more people uh, leaving their homes, more refugees than the last couple of years, than the years before. And we hear about pollution and climate change. Now, so all of these um, quite uh, depressing uh, news items coming in. Um, but underneath all of that, even though there's a lot of suffering uh, and a lot of challenges in the world, underneath all of that is also a very positive uh, story uh, that's more hidden. Uh, so we need to look at that as well. We need to look at both. Uh, so I'm going to focus on three things. Uh, innovation, leadership, and hard work. So those three are going to be themes for my talk uh, to you today. Uh, this is um, data from NASA showing how the climate is um, uh, warming up uh, since 1900. Uh, the yellow is two degrees Fahrenheit warmer, and red is four de degrees Fahrenheit uh, warmer. And we can see that the, the whole planet is um, uh, warming up. Uh, and uh, when we get to uh, today, uh, it escalates. Um, so now we're in the 19th, and we're getting close uh, to 2018. So that's a real challenge. Um, but underneath all of that, and in, ad in addition to that, we know that the last 20 years have been a time of unprecedented growth and development uh, around the world uh, from many points of view. Uh, if we are to look at the future uh, and understand the present, I think it's a good idea to start with history. Uh, so I'm going to take you through the history of uh, ideas and innovations at the same time in two minutes. Uh, at the same time as we're going to look at population growth. Uh, so there'll be a blue line, which is showing population growth and the rate of population growth. Okay, so 400,000 years ago, we discovered fire. That was helpful. We could get warm and cook, maybe. Uh, and 4,000 BC, we invented the plow so that we were able to farm the land much more efficiently. 3,500 BC, we invented the wheel, so that we didn't have to do that again. And then 3,200 BC, uh, we invented Sumerian, the first written language, so that we could share stories, not only orally, but also by writing. Uh, in year zero, um, Jesus was born, and at least in the West, we started counting our years uh, from, from that event. Um, in year 1,000, 
um, Abu um, Al Qasim Al Sarawi uh, was a doctor. He was a surgeon. He wrote books on surgery that were used 400 years after they were written. Now you can see there's 300 million people in the world around thousand, year thousand, uh, and the blue line uh, the, um, will show you how much uh, population growth is happening. Uh, 1302, we uh, invent the. Uh, compass so that we can navigate the seas uh, safer. In 1445, uh, Gutenberg uh, invents uh, the printing press so that we could uh, print books quicker. In 1656, uh, we invent uh, the clock so that we can start being late for everything. Uh, and in 1712, we have the steam engine that's invented. There's now 500 uh, million people in the world, and the Industrial Revolution slowly starts, starts taking shape. In 1803, uh, we invent the railway so that we can actually transport goods and people much more efficiently. One billion people now. 1849, uh, we invent the telephone. Uh, so the foundation is laid for Snapchat. Uh, and in 1879, uh, the light bulb uh, is uh, invented by some of the students of Thomas uh, Alva Edison. And in 1903, the brothers Wright were able to fly a plane over some distance. There's 1.7 billion people in the world today at that time. And 1908, um, we start mass producing cars at the T Ford. Uh, and in 1928, we invent penicillin, so modern medicine, and we can now see that population growth is going really, growing really rapidly, two billion people now. Uh, in 1971, the computer chip is invented and there's 3.7 billion people. In 1991, the World Wide Web uh, is uh, invented and there is now 5.3 billion people. And today, there is around 7.7 7, uh, billion people in the world. So if we take a step back and look at this, we can see um, the first point, I guess, is that innovations, uh, they drive uh, development. Um, good ideas drive development. Um, I want to say something about population growth as well. Uh, because fertility rates uh, you might know, have already been falling for a while. Uh, fertility rates in the world, how many children per uh, woman, has been falling since 65, 1965. So that has been going uh, down uh, a lot. Uh, the other point is that it's, it's not going to continue uh, to grow uh, this population. When we get up to 2050, it's much, much flatter than what it has been. Um, and the reason for that is that you know, people that have um, better health and trust that their children are going to survive have less children. We see that all uh, over the world. Uh, so in uh, 2050 and in 2100, there won't be many more babies born per year uh, than there is now. That's pretty flat. Um, but there will be more grown-ups. So that's actually a positive story. Uh, that we have better health, so we live longer, and that's exactly uh, what we want. Um, I wanted to show you also development the last 200 years. Uh, Hans Rosling uh, was a professor, um, Swedish professor um, on public health. Uh, he sadly passed away last year. Uh, he's made the graph I'm going to show you next, uh, together with his son Ola Rosling and uh, his wife, uh, Anna, um, Anna Rönnlund. Uh, and they are continuing a gap-minded the organization that uh, they started together with, uh, with Hans. Uh, so I'll show you uh, development the last 200 years when it comes to uh, income and life uh, expectancy. So we see all the countries of the world down here and in uh, 1800, none of the countries had life expectancy over 40 years, right? So life expectancy here on the y-axis and uh, income per capita uh, on the x-axis. Over here is what, where you want to be high income, right? And you want to be up there, uh, high life expectancy. And we see now we're in uh, the late 1800s uh, and the development is slow. We are, a lot of the countries are moving up and to the right. And we will see the first world war here, 
That's the First World War, and we have uh, the Great Depression in the 30s, um, and then uh, the Second World War, and then we really see that development is, is taking off. Uh, the yellow is the OECD countries, uh, the blue are the African, Sub-Saharan African countries, um, and we're getting close now uh, to uh, our own time, uh, and we see that all countries are moving up on life expectancy, uh, and almost all countries are moving to the right. Uh, and here we are in 2018. So this is a tremendous success story. Story. We need to remember that uh, that the world has actually been moving a lot in the right direction. Uh, and I, I want to stress this because I think it's really important to remember um, that a lot of things have been going well. Uh, because if we only talk about the negative all the time, uh, maybe we forget that we have been doing something right. We don't want to stop doing what we've been doing right. We want to do what we've been doing right and continue doing that, improving it, and then finding even new ways to do it even better. Uh, there's a few things, of course, that this doesn't show. There's many things. One of them is, you know, there's a huge difference, uh, variation within one country. Uh, this is, uh, you know, we only see uh, sort of the mean in each country here. Um, but anyway, I think it's important to have that uh, as part of uh, our understanding of history and our understanding uh, of uh, development. Part of this story is, or has been, the Millennium Development Goals. So these eight concrete goals that the world uh, created in the year 2000 uh, that we were supposed to reach by 2015. Now, we didn't reach all of them, but we did make a lot of progress. We halved extreme poverty, uh, and we've made progress uh, on health. There's more uh, children in school now than ever before, uh, both girls and boys. Um, so uh, the Millennium Development Goals gave us uh, some focus uh, and something to measure when we were uh, moving forward. Uh, and now, of course, it is the Sustainable Development Goals, uh, that's the next natural step, a more comprehensive agenda uh, than the eight goals we had before. So how many of you are already a little bit tired of, of, of looking at this one, this graph here, uh, and the Sustainable uh, Development Goals? Uh, put a hand up if you're a little bit tired of talking about the SDGs. Okay, so you are very courageous, the ones that just uh, lifted your hand. Actually, I think they are way too important for us to be tired of them. I am a big fan. I really like uh, the Sustainable Development Goals. I think we need to talk about them more. Uh, we need everyone to, to think about them and chip in. Um, there are some differences uh, between these and the MDGs. Uh, one is that we're all in this together. Um, that's more reflected, I think, in the uh, SDGs. It's, of course, about countries, but it's not only about top leadership, politicians, and countries' policies. It's also about uh, communities, it's about um, uh, private uh, enterprise, businesses, NGOs, uh, education, etc. Uh, and we can all use these goals. These are goals also, I think, for individuals. Uh, so it's much more personalized uh, this time around. Also, um, we see that there's um, um, a wider scope. It's uh, economic, social, it's environmental, um, and it's sort of beyond quantitative and uh, more focus on quality, uh, what type of education uh, we want, etc. And there's some completely new goals here. We have, you know, number 14 on oceans. We have a goal on sustainable cities. We have a goal on peace. Uh, so these are, you know, brand, brand new goals in the SDGs. So my goals are number one and 14, end poverty and oceans. What's your goal? Okay, good. We need, of course, all of them. They're all important. Okay. Uh, I've been talking about innovation uh, and development a little bit. I'm going to continue to talk about innovation, uh, but now about clean energy. Um, climate change, it's, it's not to underplay climate change. Climate uh, and, and man-made climate change 
uh, is a real uh, challenge and a real problem. Um, and um, we don't have all the answers yet uh, on how to tackle uh, that issue. Um, but I'll show you a few things that I learned from uh, Professor Ramez Nam um, from the Singularity University. He did a talk in Norway that I was at just two weeks ago uh, at this Norwegian energy uh, conference called the ONS. Uh, and I harassed him until he gave me some of his slides. He was like, go away. Um, I'll give them to you. Uh, so uh, he was very kind and um, uh, borrowed me some of his slides. And I'll show you uh, just some of the figures uh, that can give us uh, a little bit sense of um, that there are certain aspects here uh, that uh, gives ground for, for hope. Uh, okay, so uh, this is a coal uh, power plant uh, in Asia. Uh, and if you build a new coal power plant uh, right now, it will cost uh, approximately uh, five cents to the kilowatt hour. Um, and this is, of course, emitting a lot of uh, CO2. Um, if uh, we look at what has happened to solar and prices the last uh, 40 years, we see that the cost has um, had a 250 times price decline. Uh, so from $77 down to 30 cents. So a huge price decline uh, in the cost of solar uh, modules. Now let's look at what uh, a power plant uh, will cost. In India, remember it was five cents for the coal power plant. In India, uh, one power plant now uh, costs four uh, cents per kilowatt hour. Now that's in a low cost country. If we look at Germany, we can see that it's four euro cents per kilowatt hour. Um, and I think this shows uh, that uh, we are making some progress also when it comes uh, to renewables, but we're not there yet. Energy storage, that is another uh, aspect of this. Uh, the last uh, eight years, uh, I'll show you an example of, of battery packs. The last eight years, um, since 2010, battery pack prices have dropped by 79%. Uh, 2017 are our last, uh, our last numbers. So battery packs in electric cars, for instance, have also been dropping a lot uh, in prices. So those were just two examples of um, clean energy and how that is uh, progression, progressing. Okay, so now I've talked about innovation. Let's move uh, to leadership. If we are to create the future we want by 2050, if we are to find all the solutions, we need everyone to step up. So obviously we need our, our political leaders, uh, our uh, thought leaders, and everyone to um, you know, go um, in, in, uh, and lead us uh, in the right direction. Uh, but I think also everyone needs to step up in their own way. Uh, and in particular, what gives me hope uh, are young people and young people's leadership. Uh, and uh, here is one of my um, leadership role models. Uh, Nula Enders, I met her last year in um, Liberia when I was there with the UNDP. Uh, she is an engineering student uh, and works as an intern at the Mount Coffee power plant, which is a hydro power plant uh, that um, Liberia is um, uh, reopening uh, uh, around this time. Uh, and she grew up uh, in a community with, uh, without a lot of resources. And she understands the importance of energy for light to study. Um, and uh, we asked her to uh, record a little message for you. Uh, so here she, uh, here is, she is. My name is Nola Erna Endes. I'm 21 years old in a final year undergraduate studying electrical engineering. Growing up with electricity made me understand the dangers and mishaps in living in the dark. So I've committed myself to acquiring as much knowledge and skills as possible to help rebuild our electricity grid. This year, a journey of a thousand miles begins with the first step. So the first step begins with you. So imagine 
I think we should give her a round of applause. So imagine what will happen now when we're bringing millions of people out of extreme poverty. And we have uh, people like Nula being able to use her resources, her brain power, uh, her um, energy to find new solutions, better solutions for the future. Uh, and that's exactly uh, what we need. Uh, one of the positives uh, of uh, bringing people out of, of poverty. I have one more example for you uh, on a problem uh, that uh, leads to uh, someone uh, thinking about how to solve it uh, and again to, to leadership. Uh, so, um, as you know, plastic in the oceans is a big problem. Our oceans are not doing well. Um, the ocean's health uh, is not the way it should be. Um, we are polluting it, um, and also with climate change, uh, it is um, um, also uh, threatening marine life. Um, so we see that plastic is, um, even in remote areas, uh, you can find plastic on beaches, and a lot of it at, ends up in the ocean, uh, which um, is a challenge. So, uh, Boyan Slut, uh, he's a, a Dutch uh, guy that uh, looked at this problem uh, when he was 16. Uh, and he thought this was, this was serious, and he didn't want this to uh, continue, so he wanted to do something about it. Um, he went on to study uh, engineering, um, rocket science actually, uh, and uh, he quit his studies to start the ocean cleanup. He had this idea uh, of how to do it when he was uh, 19, uh, and um, I'll let this little video explain it to you. 1.8 trillion pieces of plastic float at the surface of the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. Here, the ocean cleanup is deploying the world's first technological solution to this growing problem. The principle behind it is simple. Create a coastline where there are none. Concentrate the plastic and take it out. So this is um, uh, yet another example uh, of how you have a problem. Someone's engaged uh, and motivated to, to solve it. Uh, they have trials. Uh, they fail. Uh, they try again, and eventually, hopefully, uh, they'll be a success. Uh, so, last uh, week, uh, or two weeks ago now, um, the first ocean clean-up device was towed out uh, in the Bay Area through uh, the Golden Gate Bridge. It's now uh, doing um, full-scale scale testing, and if that goes well, it will be towed all the way out to the garbage patch uh, in the Pacific. Uh, and start um, harvesting plastic and sending it on shore for uh, recycling. Um, and if that goes well, uh, the hope is to have 50 of these uh, systems, 50 or 60, uh, the next um, uh, five years, so that they can, uh, if, if they produce uh, or, or uh, go into the garbage patches for five years, uh, the estimate is that they will be able to collect 50% of uh, the plastic uh, that is there. Okay, so that's uh, another example, I think, um, that should make us hopeful that all these problems that are created by people can be solved um, by people. Okay, I have one last point, um, and um, uh, I'll, I'll show you uh, another one of uh, my heroes. Uh, this is uh, Therese Jakobsen. Uh, she is from Balsfjord uh, in northern Norway. Uh, I met her in 2015, uh, and she was 100 years old uh, at the time, uh, having her own um, little business uh, producing mittens, uh, and she was 24 when World War II broke out. Uh, she's still alive and well, uh, and I, was, um, I asked her, what is uh, the most important lesson that you have learned in your experience? Um, and she said, when I was young, we worked hard. 
But I don't think that was a bad thing. I think that was a good thing. Uh, I think we need to work hard, and I think working hard is part of having a good life, a meaningful life. Um, so Teresa, um, I think, is going to leave you with, uh, with the last point uh, of the three, um, that if we are to succeed in creating a bright future, we also have to get at it uh, and work hard. So we need to take ownership of the goals. Uh, we need to domesticate uh, and personalize them. Um, so I've talked about innovation, uh, leadership, and hard work. Let me leave you with, with three uh, messages. One, remember, please, everything we have achieved in addition to the challenges. Number two, have faith in your own ability to make a difference, to change your world to the better. Don't underestimate what a few good people uh, can do to change the world. In fact, I guess that is the way uh, all change starts, right? Um, and three, thank you. Well, thank you for being here and showing interest in these topics. I know that all of you are already uh, doing work um, to reach some of, of these uh, goals here. So thank you for your dedication uh, and uh, for uh, your will uh, to make the world a better place. Thank you for your attention. Fantastic. <laughs> Wonderful. We go over here. Yeah. Thank you very much for that great uh, amazing lecture and uh, history le uh, lesson. Uh, we covered 10,000 years, uh, all key technologies and important trends. And um, I think it was very, very illuminating. And I, I would say uh, also in my own reflection, when you think about uh, all that uh, the Crown Prince uh, just showed us, um, one common feature is acceleration. Now, uh, change is faster than ever, and we are accelerating. That means that if we're in the right direction, we can move faster than ever to uh, make things right. Poverty can end faster than ever. In China, poverty has gone down from 80%, perhaps uh, 40 years ago, to essentially zero today, uh, an unmatched uh, human achievement. If we're going in the wrong direction, then the acceleration is disaster. Uh, that global warming map at the beginning is a map of acceleration, because not only is the planet warming, it's warming faster uh, per uh, time period than uh, in the past by far, because the human impact is so much faster. So I think one could say that uh, it's not an argument about whether things are getting better or getting worse. The answer is both. It's an argument about what direction we're going in. And when we know that we're in a dangerous direction on climate change or a dangerous direction on inequality or a dangerous direction uh, on uh, destruction of uh, biodiversity or destruction of the oceans, then we should appreciate, I think, that the acceleration means that the damage that can be done is faster than we can imagine because we're in an overwhelming wave of change right now. I was uh, taken and uh, I had not seen the example of collecting the plastics. That was uh, new for me. I did, did not know about that. I wonder, since you are helping to lead uh, SDG 14, what other areas are you engaged in to save the oceans? Because we had, for example, uh, with us a couple of days ago, the Minister of Fisheries of Indonesia. What she told us, uh, and she was a re really remarkable minister, but she told us basically that Indonesia is being 
completely fished out by illegal fishing and they can barely control it because there are so many fishing fleets there, Chinese, uh, others coming from all over the world, and they're now using satellite data to try to uh, find who is doing what where, but the ships turn off their transponders or they have 10 flags uh, that they're carrying uh, to uh, be able to maneuver and so on. I wonder whether you're taking on the fisheries because uh, after all, Norway is one of the great fishing countries of the world. Uh, the depletion of the fisheries, the microplastics, uh, and other areas. I'd love to hear more about the oceans. Yes, well, first of all, I think um, my love from the oceans just come from uh, growing up during the summer uh, very close to the ocean. My family has always been very fond of activities that are connected to the ocean. Uh, and I, I, I think when, uh, when we're in the element, um, when I'm pushing one of my kids on the wave, um, on the surfboard, um, I, I get this feeling that I'm connected to nature uh, in a very profound way. Um, and I think that in all our moderni modernity, we've maybe forgotten that um, we are actually part of nature. It feels like it's nature and then us. But that's not the case. We as human beings are nature. And I think if we understand that uh, on a profound level, uh, we're more equipped uh, to take uh, good um, decisions when it comes to the environment, uh, because if we take care of the environment, or taking care of the environment is actually taking care of ourselves. Uh, so it, it just makes uh, perfect sense. Until now, I was about uh, 30, I thought food came from a grocery store, not from yeah, a farm. <laughs> exactly. so I finally found out, someone told me, they never mentioned it in my economics classes, by the way. Uh, but uh, I, I finally discovered it. <laughs> so. Um, uh, so the oceans uh, are hugely important. Um, we um, don't know enough about the oceans. We need to, um, to find out more. Uh, but we do know uh, that there is a lot of things uh, that um, uh, we're doing uh, that is harming uh, the life uh, below uh, the sea um, surface. Uh, now, Norway uh, is doing quite a lot. My government uh, has taken an initiative uh, for a high-level panel on the sustainable oceans. Oh, great. Uh, so uh, that's happening, and also taking an initiative uh, to a fund uh, supporting that. Um, and um, my government is, is um, focusing on uh, sustainable use of the ocean. Uh, so not only protecting, uh, but it's the right mix between uh, fishery, uh, fishing uh, and, and uh, taking the resources out of the ocean, but in such a way that it can continue uh, on an, in an infinite way so that we actually do it in a sustainable way. Um, and I think also for, for the future, uh, there are uh, many challenges ahead. We're going to be 10 billion people right, in not, not too far um, into the future. Uh, and a lot of the solutions uh, lie in the ocean uh, for medicine, uh, for nutrients, uh, for food, uh, for livelihoods, etc. Uh, but all of that depends on us um, managing the oceans in a sustainable way. Uh, so it's, it's really core, I think, to um, bringing us forward and, and getting us uh, closer to reaching uh, these 17 goals. I was uh, speaking with the uh, uh, Prime Minister of uh, New Zealand uh, earlier and noting that uh, her country ranks high, very high on uh, the Sustainable Development Goals and Happiness. I have to say Norway ranks even higher uh, because it's, uh, I think, number two on the SDG index and uh, usually bouncing around between one and three on the happiness. Can you explain that to us so we can copy it? We're trying to figure out what's going on there <laughs> because we need it. <laughs> we keep falling in happiness here, so we're trying to figure out what is the recipe. I love getting this question from you because, you know, I, I read Jeffrey Sachs' book to understand the world, and now you're asking me the question. Um, so this is interesting. And I'm going to write it in a book when you answer it. <laughs> um, 
okay, so uh, Norway has been doing well. Um, I think one, I, I, I don't have the complete answer to this. Uh, one is, of course, that we're in a peaceful part of the world. Um, war is the most costly, the most problematic, what really uh, jeopardizes uh, development and produces, of course, a lot of suffering. And we've been lucky that we have not been in uh, an armed conflict in, on our own soil uh, since uh, the Second World War. Uh, so peace is important, hugely important uh, for development. Uh, secondly, I would say um, gender equality. Uh, in Norway, um, we uh, are not there yet. It's not complete gender equality. Uh, but I do think that um, uh, Norway has come quite far uh, in, on that topic. Uh, and it just makes complete sense, both, of course, from an ethical standpoint, that all people should have the same, um, the same prospects of a career, uh, the same possibilities, uh, but also from an economic uh, standpoint, to uh, instead of using 50% of the population uh, to uh, create value, you're using 100% uh, of the know-how, the brain power, uh, and I think um, that has been an important part of, of the Norwegian success uh, as well. And, and just uh, one comment about the happiness index, I think, um, that we were ranked very high in the happiness index. One year we were number one. I think that came as a big surprise to, all, to a lot of Norwegians. Uh, but so, because, of course, uh, we see a, a lot of challenges and, and problems. Uh, but uh, it somehow rotated between the Norwegians, the Danes, the Swedes, and the Finns, trading places for, for, for number one. Uh, we have a little pet theory at home that uh, uh, I don't know if it's right, we're actually testing it this year, but uh, Norway is about the highest uh, coffee per capita consumption in the yeah, world. I heard that uh, too. And uh, this may be the direct uh, effect. Um, <laughs> but uh, if I may, uh, I hope not presumptuously and very heretically from an American point of view, another uh, part of uh, uh, Norway's success and clearly Scandinavia's success is the incredible success of politics uh, that you have politics that uh, is consensual, stable, uh, directed towards uh, the common good, and uh, very different from ours in that uh, it's at a human scale still. Maybe this is also the scale question of a country of uh, a few million people and a, a, a continental country. But I've always been impressed uh, in Norway, uh, we've been at dinners and the prime minister would drop in sometimes. Uh, and that's nothing special. No big motorcades, uh, no uh, cordoning off neighborhoods, uh, just uh, driving over uh, by himself uh, and uh, spending the evening. And uh, that I think is, uh, keeps the, the, the humanism of it. And now I'll say something very heretical. Uh, uh, it, from an American context, but um, to my idea, you also represent something that is quite uh, special, which is that um, the really happy countries are constitutional monarchies. Uh, and uh, it's an empirical fact, I'm just <laughs> telling you. I'm, I'm using the occasion. Uh, think of it, Americans, uh, we could have as our head of state, Queen Elizabeth, or Donald Trump. Uh, <laughs> I rest my case. Uh, but constitutional monarchies uh, really have uh, worked. I got to ask you about that, uh, because what do you think about that? Well, I, uh, you know, Hans Rosling, um, that I mentioned in my talk, uh, showed me this uh, graph, uh, uh, I think, uh, the second uh, day, or the day after I met him the first time. Uh, and he showed me uh, how uh, development um, uh, had been going and which of the countries um, were monarchies. Uh, and he was very clear that he was a Republican. He was, so in Europe, that means that you're in favor of a president uh, instead of a monarchy. Um, and he, he showed it to me and he showed me how uh, these monarchies were doing really well when it came to, to development. Uh, and he said, well, you can read this in two ways. Either the monarchies are good for development or uh, these are countries that have been doing well, and because of that, they've kept that system. Didn't have the revolution. Uh, that uh, they haven't had like a crisis 
uh, on their path uh, to development. Uh, but I think, uh, in all honesty, there are many ways of uh, creating um, a good political system that, that works well. Um, I don't think uh, one necessarily needs to completely copy uh, one system um, you know, to other places. Um, there's many ways of, of making it work for people. Well said, and uh, we will end here. Uh, we thank you for being with us. Uh, really inspiring. Thanks. Thank you. Beautiful. Wonderful.